we've just heard the judge summing up and instructing the jurors about how they are to decide whether the defendant in this case is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. The judge gave the jurors instructions about the standard of proof required for a verdict and instructions about who has the burden of proof in proving the defendant's guilt. These instructions are supposed to help the jury reach the correct verdict. Now here's the full version of these instructions as used in some jurisdictions in Australia. Onus of proof. As this is a criminal trial, the burden or obligation of proof of the guilt of the accused is placed squarely on the Crown. That burden rests upon the Crown in respect of every element or essential fact that makes up the offence with which the accused has been charged. That burden never shifts to the accused. There is no obligation whatsoever on the accused to prove any fact or issue that is in dispute before you. It is, of course, not for the accused to prove his or her innocence, but for the Crown to establish his or her guilt. A critical part of the criminal justice system is the presumption of innocence. What it means is that a person charged with a criminal offence is presumed to be innocent unless and until the Crown persuades a jury that the person is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Standard of proof. The Crown must prove the accused guilt beyond reasonable doubt. That is the high standard of proof that the Crown must achieve before you can convict the accused. At the end of your consideration of the evidence in the trial and the submissions made to you by the parties, you must ask yourself whether the Crown has established the accused's guilt beyond reasonable doubt. In other words, you should ask yourself, is there any reasonable possibility that the accused is not guilty? However, the Crown does not have the burden of proving beyond reasonable doubt every single fact that arises from the evidence and is in dispute. The obligation that rests upon the Crown is to prove the elements of the charge, that is, the essential facts that go to make up the charge, and must prove those facts beyond reasonable doubt. I shall shortly outline for you what are the elements of the charge or the essential facts that the Crown must prove beyond reasonable doubt. In a criminal trial, there is only one ultimate issue that a jury has to decide. Has the Crown proved the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt? If the answer is yes, the appropriate verdict is guilty. If the answer is no, the verdict must be not guilty. How well do you think you understood what the judge was asking jurors to do? Well, we can give you pretty clear feedback about whether you understood what the burden of proof was. In this case, the burden of proof was wholly on the prosecution. This means that it's up to the prosecution to prove that the defendant is guilty by presenting evidence that shows that it was the defendant who committed the crime and that the defendant meant to cause serious harm or death to the victim. The correct interpretation of this direction recognises that the defendant does not have to prove that he is innocent. So the defendant does not have to provide any evidence at all. It is completely up to the prosecution to make the case. However, giving you a clear explanation of the standard of proof and so feedback on whether you understood it or not is a bit trickier. There's often no agreed definition of what beyond reasonable doubt means in many jurisdictions. In some jurisdictions this is defined as meaning that you are sure that the defendant is guilty or you are sure that there is no other plausible or reasonable explanation for the evidence presented in the case. In other jurisdictions it's simply defined as just meaning that you have no doubt that is reasonable, which is a circular definition. One misconception that our research has identified, however, is that beyond reasonable doubt means that you have no doubt at all. This is not actually the case. A correct interpretation of beyond reasonable doubt can mean that you have some doubt about the defendant's guilt, but that that doubt just can't be reasonable or perhaps sensible doubt. In Queensland, at least, it has been suggested that beyond reasonable doubt can be clarified by making it clear to jurors that it doesn't mean no doubts at all. So how did you go with your explanations of these two instructions? Did you get them both correct? And were your feelings about whether you got them correct in line with whether you actually got them correct? We'll return shortly to consider whether people's perceptions of their understanding of such instructions matches their actual level of understanding of those instructions in a minute. So, how important are instructions for how a jury decides its verdict? In our drama, you obviously heard a very abbreviated version of this phase of the trial. We only had a few minutes to show you what happened in the trial, not several days, weeks, or even perhaps months, as happens in real trials. In some jurisdictions, the summing up and instruction part of a trial can take a substantial period of time, even as long as the presentation of evidence itself during the trial. 
This is one of the reasons that law reform bodies and researchers have focused on understanding the effect of this part of the trial. Longer summing ups and instructions to jurors make the trial more expensive and create unnecessary delays in the legal system. Let's ignore the summing up part of the trial for a second and focus on the issue of judicial instructions. Are those instructions, or directions as they are sometimes called, useful for jurors in making their decisions? Well, to answer that question, we have to first of all ask whether jurors can actually understand what they're being asked to do. McCabe and Perves, reporting on the London School of Economics Jury Research Project in 1974, asked shadow jurors about their experiences. A shadow jury is when members of the public attend a real trial and form a second jury for the purposes of the research project. They're not actually deciding the verdict in the case, but they experience the same evidence as the real jury. Typically, they sit in a public gallery. Because they're not the real jury, researchers are allowed to record their deliberations and ask them lots of questions about how they make their decisions. This research suggested that jurors are conscientious about their task. They try really hard to do what they've been asked to do. However, research by Stevenson in 1992 suggested that this conscientiousness fades away during the trial, unfortunately. This doesn't say a lot about jurors' comprehension of what they're asked to do, only that they appear to be motivated to do what they think they're being asked to do. Zander and Henderson's 1993 study reported that 90% of 8,000 jurors had been able to understand and remember the evidence, and that the prosecution and defence barristers thought the jury would have no trouble understanding or remembering the evidence. That research relied on jurors' own self-reports of comprehension, whether they thought they could understand the evidence and judicial instructions, and also the reports of the lawyers involved in the case. Other self-report data agrees with these findings. In a study by Jackson in 1992, 65% of jurors said they understood all of the judge's instructions and a further 25% said they understood most of the instructions. So that's a total of 90%, much the same as Zander and Henderson found. Consistent with this, Cutler and Hughes in 2001 reported that 96.6% of jurors in their study said that the judge's instructions were clear and understandable. Now, from a research perspective, even though this is interesting in that it tells us what jurors think they understand, it might not be a very reliable indicator of actual comprehension. So why can't we rely on jurors' self-reported understanding of instructions? There's a pretty strong social pressure on a juror to say that he or she understands the task at hand. To return a verdict and then admit to a researcher that you didn't understand what you were meant to be doing would look pretty bad, really. The research relying on more direct measures of comprehension is generally pretty consistent, and unfortunately it paints a different picture about jurors' comprehension of instructions. Such research has either asked jurors and mock jurors to paraphrase what the judicial instructions mean, this is a test developed by Charo and Charo in 1979, or has given jurors and mock jurors a multiple choice test. When we asked you what the judge's instructions meant at the start of the episode, we asked both of these types of questions. The short version is that jurors struggle to understand what they're asked to do. For example, Reifman, Gussick and Ellsworth in 1992 reported that only 41% of jurors actually understood the substantive law when they were tested objectively. They also showed that those jurors who were given instructions performed just as well as those who were not given instructions. So either comprehension was poor or jurors didn't actually rely on those instructions. In terms of understanding both of the instructions we spoke about earlier in this presentation, our own research suggests that only about a third of jurors correctly interpret both of the instructions to do a standard of proof and burden of proof. Two thirds understand one or the other. These are not unusual findings. Work by Severance and colleagues in 1992 also shows that jurors display serious difficulty comprehending differences between legal concepts. As reported by Surratt in 1995, jurors who were surveyed as part of the Capital Jury Project could remember the details of the defendant, but they could not understand or remember the legal rules relating to their decision to impose a death penalty. This difficulty in remembering the legal rules is part of a more general issue where jurors have difficulty in remembering information about trials. For example, Hastie and colleagues' 1983 study found that jurors had poor recall of trial information. This problem is made worse in complex cases, according to some research by Nathanson in 1995. Now, jurors themselves have some insight into the problems with the evidence and instructions. Hugh and Penrod found in 1995 as well that as case complexity increased, jurors felt less sure that their verdict reflected a proper understanding of the instructions. Hugh and Penrod in 1994 also surveyed 81% of jurors in 160 trials. They found that as the amount of information increased, 
jurors admitted that it was harder to decide the case. And so difficulties in remembering trial details and also the legal instructions about how to decide the verdict make it difficult for jurors to do their job. There's additional evidence from Sandy's 1995 study that jurors fail to separate judgments of guilt and punishment in capital cases in the United States. Although the guilt and punishment phases of capital trials are meant to be separate and the decisions based on different sets of evidence, it seems that both decisions are made at the same time. We also know from Casper and Benedict's 1993 research that jurors do not ignore extra legal or inadmissible evidence, even when instructed to do so. We spoke about some of these issues in a previous presentation. So overall, while there is some variation in comprehension from study to study, according to Bornstein and Green in 2011, figures of about 50% of people actually understanding directions seem to be about typical. From Rose and Ogloff's 2001 research, we also know that deliberating as a group doesn't seem to improve the state of affairs. So this is obviously somewhat concerning. The point of this research is not to suggest that jurors are incapable of acting as deciders of fact, as they've been instructed to do so, but rather to highlight that there was a problem with how they're being asked to do their job. So there is a problem with the instructions, not with the jurors themselves. Just to give you an example of how complex the instructions have become in some cases, here's an instruction about motive to lie. There are a number of matters that arise out of that line of questions and the argument about which I must give you direction. The first is this. The defence argued to you that there are a number of reasons why complainant A might be telling lies about the conduct of the accused to him. The prosecution, on the other hand, of course, argued that complainant A was a truthful witness and you should accept him as a witness of truth in relation to what he says the accused did to him. The prosecution argues that even accepting the combination of events occurring in complainant A's life at the time, that this does not make his evidence untruthful or unreliable. It is very important that you understand that if you accept the prosecution argument that notwithstanding all of these things were happening to complainant A at the time, and therefore that you reject the defence argument that complainant A was lying because he wanted to divert attention away from his own wrongdoing and to get himself back into the school, and because people were trying to induce him to say things about name withheld, if you reject that defence argument, all that means is you have rejected one of the arguments advanced by the defence as to why you should reject the evidence of complainant A. It is not the same by rejecting an argument that these were motives that induced complainant A to lie. It is not the same as saying, because I have rejected these motives, therefore I find he was telling the truth. So it is one thing to say, I reject the argument that he lied because he had a motive, but it does not automatically convert complainant A's evidence into the truth. That is a separate and independent assessment that you must make. Two things flow from that. First is, do I have mentioned, all you have done if you reject the argument is reject one possible basis for rejecting complainant A's evidence. It may still be possible that he's lying for an argument that you do not know about, and that the defence did not know about. So just because you reject, if you reject a possible motive advanced by the defence, does not mean that there could not be other motives. So rejection of arguments about motive to lie do not make complainant A's evidence by that reason alone any more credible. Now, right, obviously we had to speed up the instruction. If we had read the instruction out at normal speed, it would have taken about 30 or 40 minutes. So why have instructions become so complex when this complexity seems to be at odds with the very purpose of helping jurors make their decisions correctly? Well, the reason why this is, is because instructions are often designed and given with two purposes in mind. The first purpose should be pretty obvious, to help jurors make decisions in the legally correct way. The second purpose, however, is to protect the jury's verdict against appeal. Courts are generally arranged in a hierarchy. The lower courts will hear the less serious matters and also the preliminary matters for the more serious cases. The higher courts, such as the district court and the supreme courts in my jurisdiction, will run the jury trials for the serious crimes. At the conclusion of a trial, if a defendant is convicted, he or she may instruct their lawyers to appeal to the court of appeal or even the high court if the result of the first appeal is to be appealed. The high court is the highest court in Australia. The equivalent in other jurisdictions will likely have a different name. Because a jury doesn't provide written reasons for their verdict, as in a judge-only trial, the only basis for appeal is generally misinstruction or misdirection. That is, that the judge gave an incorrect instruction or failed to give an appropriate instruction. Because jury trials are very time-consuming and expensive and they can be traumatic for witnesses and victims, judges generally want to avoid avenues for appeal in jury trials. One way they do this is to rely on directions that have been written to protect against appeal. These might be standard instructions that have survived previous appeals or instructions that cover every possible verdict option and defence, even if not raised in the actual case. Such instructions can be very lengthy and contain a lot of technical legal language which is aimed at the appeals judges, not the jurors. Entities such as the American Bar Association and Law Reform Commissions in other jurisdictions have recommended rewriting instructions in simpler terminology so that they are easy to understand. So does simplification work? 
Well, some of the earlier research in this area suggested that it does. Our working colleagues in 1977 found that when they rewrite instructions using psycholinguistic principles, jurors' comprehension of those instructions improved. Now, these findings have been criticised because they assess comprehension using the paraphrase test, which critics such as Severance and Loftus argue test memory rather than comprehension. Other types of tests, such as multiple choice tests that has been used by researchers like Brewer and colleagues in 2004, and looking at whether jurors use directions, such as in a research by Rose and Ogloff in 2001, also suggest that simplification can improve comprehension. Now, it's quite possible, though, that even if jurors understand the directions they're given, they might not follow them. It's also possible that jurors might reach good or reasonable decisions, even if they don't understand the directions themselves. It's true, though, that some legal commentators would argue that a decision isn't sound unless it's based on the correct legal principle. So, will jurors follow the instructions if they've been simplified? Well, this depends on what we assume about how jurors make decisions. We spent some time talking about this in a previous presentation. The focus on simplification of judicial instructions assumes a fairly mechanistic decision-making process for jurors. A and B in this example are bits of information or evidence, D is the directions, and V is the verdict. This is a, an abstract representation of an algebraic model of jury decision-making, similar to the algebraic models of person perception that were popular for a while. Now, according to this model, as long as jurors can understand the directions, they'll combine the evidence A and B in appropriate matter, taking into account the ways that they are meant to use the evidence as indicated in the directions, D, to arrive at a verdict, V. The assumption that just simplifying instructions should fix the issue, unfortunately, doesn't deal with any of the later stage of information processing that perceivers are thought to engage in when evaluating judicial instructions which are really just actually persuasive messages. According to Maguire's model of persuasion, there are additional steps before and after comprehension that a message must survive to have an impact. Crucially, not only do jurors have to comprehend what they're being asked to do, but they have to accept that this is the correct way to make the decision, and then also be able to remember the instruction and apply it in their decision making. This assumption is also inconsistent with what we know about how jurors make decisions and what they're asked to rely on, which is their common sense. In an earlier video, we talked about Pennington and Hastie's story model of jury decision making. Now remember, in that model, jurors create a story to help make sense of the evidence as it's presented at the trial. This model implies that merely understanding directions will not necessarily lead to information being combined in the desired way. Even if jurors understand directions, they might not actually use those directions in making decisions, if doing so would be incompatible with the story they've generated to understand the evidence. So perhaps the best way to encourage jurors to make decisions in legally appropriate ways is not to tell them what to do, but to set up their decision-making task in a way that naturally guides them to make their decision in the appropriate way. Question trials, which turn the problem of applying abstract legal rules to the facts of the case into direct questions of facts about the current case, are being used in some jurisdictions like New Zealand. These look like a promising way to address the issue with jurors' comprehension of judicial instructions. Of course, as this is a relatively recent development, we need to wait and see what the research says about the efficacy of this innovative way of helping jurors to make decisions. The promising thing about question trials is that this approach acknowledges that the problem with comprehension of instructions is with the instructions themselves, not the jurors. And importantly, they appear to provide support to jurors in a way that doesn't rely on jurors having to understand complex legal rules and concepts. Researchers have also tested a range of other techniques as well, including flowcharts and diagrams with varying levels of success. What the research on instructions tells us, though, is that a juror's task is a complex one, and we have to accept that jurors are human too, and come with all of the cognitive capacities and limitations that humans in general have. They aren't decision-making machines. With these two things in mind, our best avenue for facilitating legally correct decisions by jurors is to support them in their tasks and not expect them to be experts about legal concepts and rules. They are deciders of fact, after all, and their task and the instructions they are given need to be structured around that reality.